I'm going to have the, the honor of introducing um, Dr. Svetlana Savranska to all of you uh, for today's talk. Um, and uh, I've actually been very lucky to work uh, alongside uh, Dr. Savranska on a wonderful project that we had um, you know, together this past year called The Bridge, where we were opening up options for um, archive work in Russia, uh, even in the year of a pandemic, it is still possible. And um, I'm sure that Dr. Savlansky can talk a little bit about that. And um, definitely the subject matter that she's discussing today is informed um, by the documents that she's able to get access to through some really, really hard work. Um, Dr. Svetlana Savranska is the director of Russia programs uh, since 2001 at the National Security Archive, um, George Washington University. She is the author uh, with Tom Blanton, who uh, we heard from yesterday, of the book, The Last Superpower Summits, Gorbachev, Reagan, and Bush, which won Choice Magazine's Outstanding Academic Title Award in 2017. And the editor of the book by the late Sergo Mikoyan, The Soviet Cuban Missile Crisis, Castro Mikoyan, Kennedy Khrushchev, and the Missiles of November. Dr. Savranske won the Link Kuehl Prize in 2011 from the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, recognizing the best documentary publication over the previous two years for her book, Masterpieces of History, The Peaceful End of the Cold War in Europe, 1989. She is author and co-author of multiple publications on the Cuban Missile Crisis, Nuclear Learning, and the End of the Cold War, which will be the topic of today's uh, discussion. She also serves as adjunct professor of teaching uh, U.S.-Russian relations and contemporary Russian politics at the American University School of International Service in Washington, D.C. She earned her Ph.D. in political science and international affairs in 1998 from Emory University, where she studied with professors Robert Pastor and Thomas Remington. So without further ado, I would like to pass the virtual microphone to Dr. Svetlana Savranska for today's talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this very nice introduction. And I am really happy to participate again in the Monterey Symposium. I think you are very lucky to be attending this great symposium. I, I only wish it was in person um, to get a chance to meet you, to get a chance to interact with other really wonderful lecturers that um, Anna Vasilieva brought together. So today we will be talking about NATO expansion and uh, the debate about NATO expansion throughout the 1990s and today in Russia. I just came back from Russia literally last night. So if I feel a little sleepy, I really apologize. I'm so badly jet lagged, but I, I think this is one of the most interesting subjects. <clears throat> Um, of the post-Cold War period. And if you were in Russia today, you would think that this is one of the highest priorities that people still are discussing. And it still has a lot of impact on US-Russian relations and Russian-European relations. So the way we would <clears throat> do it, I think I will lecture for about 35 minutes. 35, 40, I have a tendency when speaking on this subject to run over my time, time limit. But I think in a way, you guys all have Zoom tiredness now after all these days that you've been staring at the computer. So if, if you would like to ask a question in the middle of the lecture, just uh, send a message by chat or just, you know, if I don't see it, just interrupt me and ask the question. And we can address that question right then. But if you don't have any questions in the middle of the lecture, then we could talk, we could, you know, certainly address it in the question and answer period. Is that um, agreeable? Okay, great. And I, um, I think this is <clears throat> this is something that many uh, lecturers in the symposium before me mentioned. Uh, this is what Jarlath just told me. So what I would like to do is to take you a little bit in depth. I would like to take you to the 1990s and kind of to the to the origins, to the time when this 
question was raised for the very first time and kind of talk about misunderstandings and myths, if you want, um, misperceptions about the subject. So let's let's go back first to the very the very first time when this subject was mentioned, and that is the very beginning of the 1990s. Um, this question was raised during the debate on German unification. The Soviets, led by Gorbachev, remember Mikhail Gorbachev, who uh, um, came to power in 19. 85 and announced glasnost and perestroika i know you probably are so well informed about all that but i find that with the new generation of students sometimes these events um, seem like ancient history so anyway during the german unification debate um, gorbachev initially was in favor of very slow process of German unification. And the reason for that was that Gorbachev had this grand idea of common European home. He had the idea, which actually was mentioned by Immanuel Kant before, and was mentioned by Victor Hugo before, then Russia will join the European nations in one big common home. But could be real. So for him, this pan-European cooperation, pan-European institutions, building these institutions, was the highest priority that the Soviets did not use force in Europe when they withdrew their troops, and they did not even threaten force. They did not try to force the uh, East European countries to stay within the Warsaw Pact because they believed that with the end of the Cold War, Russia will become part of this common European home, and you don't want to use force in your own home. And there was no need to force them to stay in the Warsaw Pact if the new Soviet Union could join Europe. That was the idea. Now, when Germany began the process of unification, the Soviets were concerned that now all the attention in Europe will switch from building common European institutions and strengthening CSC, which is now OSC, from that to German unification. They did not try to prevent German unification, but the Soviets were very strongly against the German unification in NATO. They tried to do everything possible to prevent German unification in NATO. And at some point they were more or less successful because they could have, um, as one of the uh, victorious powers in World War II, they could have offered coal significant concessions and faster unification if coal, Helmut Kohl, the Chancellor of Germany, if he agreed for um, some other, agreed for a different option of German unification outside NATO. The United States was strongly against it uh, because the United States, President Bush and Secretary of State James Baker believed that bringing Germany into NATO will address security concerns of united germany but even more importantly the security concerns of europe because many people in europe many leaders such as margaret thatcher and francois mitterrand were concerned about the future of strong powerful united germany right in the middle of europe uh, they were concerned that Germany might develop more militaristic uh, policy in the future. So essentially, at this moment, <clears throat> the question was decided that Germany will unify in NATO. 
Uh, the last attempt that Gorbachev made to persuade the Americans that we should build the European institutions rather than strengthening NATO was in May 1990 when Baker came to Moscow. And here Gorbachev was asking uh, whether it would, would be a better idea to build the common European home to which Baker responded with this really memorable phrase which expressed the US position on European institutions. He said, <clears throat> it's nice to talk about pan-European security structures. The role of the CSC, it is a wonderful dream, but just a dream. In the meantime, NATO exists and participation in NATO will mean that Germany will continue to rely on this alliance to ensure its security. So that was a done deal in the summer of 1990, Germany began unification in NATO. While Gorbachev and the Soviets were talking through these issues in the back of their minds, there was constant threat that if in the future, something will happen with the Warsaw Pact, the East European allies, former allies, might want to join NATO and NATO might want to expand to swallow Eastern Europe and move the borders of NATO to the borders of the Soviet Union. Of course, at that time, nobody thought about the possibility of the Soviet Union breaking apart. And in many conversations, Gorbachev received assurances, repeated assurances, not just from the Americans, but beginning from the Americans, uh, from Bush, uh, from um, Gates, from Baker, that the security interests of the Soviet Union will be taken into account and NATO will not expand to the East. He also received these assurances from other European leaders uh, Mitterrand, um, Thatcher, um, and other leaders, including the Secretary General Manfred Warner of NATO. So the Soviets at the end of the Soviet Union had this idea, this understanding that they thought was a commitment that NATO will not expand. At the same time, there was no consensus in East in Eastern Europe, whether um, East European countries would be interested in joining NATO. We think now that they always wanted to join NATO. There's this kind of uh, perception that we all have now that from the very beginning when the Warsaw Pact broke, East European countries were motivated by their desire to join NATO. In fact, it was not quite like that. Um, most East European leaders at the time, with the exception of Lech Walesa in Poland, who uh, very strongly and very early on argued that Poland should join NATO, other East European leaders actually argued for the strengthening of the European institutions, especially Václav Havel. Václav Havel believed with, that with the end of the Cold War, both blocs should dissolve. And in, in this space, uh, after the dissolution of both the Warsaw Pact and NATO, there should be new European institutions and there should be no foreign forces in Europe. So both the American forces and the Soviet forces must leave. This is where we are at the very end of the Soviet Union. The Cold War has already ended. I believe Cold War ended somewhere in 1989, definitely maybe even in the end of 1988. So the Soviets at the moment believe, well, unfortunately Germany unified in NATO, but now Russia will have a new relationship with NATO and NATO will not expand. Meanwhile, the Russians and the Europeans would be working on these new European structures. Here a question comes up, would President Bush have expanded NATO if he got a second term? This is a very interesting question. Some people uh, like uh, Joshua Schifferinson believe that yes, 
President Bush, the father, would have expanded NATO. And in fact, that there were already discussions in the administration leading to possible NATO expansion. I do agree that there were discussions, but it seems to me from the documents that I've seen that uh, President Bush was not eager to expand NATO. His main achievement was unification of Germany in NATO. He believed that NATO was important because uh, NATO was key to the American presence in Europe, um, not the European Union and not the CSC, because the, in NATO, the United States had the decisive voice. Uh, so NATO was tied to the US global role and status, but there was no perceived need to expand NATO now, at least you know, now in his second administration, but we know that it did not happen. At the same time, the social democratic left and the dissidents in Eastern Europe were not calling uh, for NATO membership. One of the important things that I would like to emphasize in this lecture is that there is nothing inevitable in the story that we're looking at. It truly was a story of contingencies, human factor, and intervening variables. So here is intervening variable number one that significantly changed how the story developed. Um, Havel, President Havel of Czechoslovakia and uh, later of the Czech Republic, went to Washington in, uh, 19, in early 1990. And in his conversations with President Bush, he began changing his view under the slight pressure or slight persuasion from the Americans. He, while he was calling for dissolution of NATO initially, now he believed that uh, Czechoslovakia, new Czechoslovakia, should develop good relationship with NATO. NATO actually would be the key to the European security. Still, he argued for not isolating Russia. And this is a very important theme that uh, was very active in conversations in the 1990s that you can't isolate in Russia. If you isolate Russia, that would lead to severe consequences. And one way of isolating Russia was expanding NATO. As I mentioned before, one person who was very uh, vocal and very active in favor of uh, expanding NATO, but also isolating Russia was Lech Walesa of Poland. What else happened, which was a major intervening variable and certainly was not um, anticipated by many of the political leaders at the time is then Yugoslavia began its very violent process of breaking up. And the European countries who were at the moment uh, involved in uh, preparations for the European Union and a new stage of integration essentially were doing nothing, looking at the dissolving Yugoslavia. And when uh, military action and bloodshed started in Yugoslavia, a question arose in Europe, who will take care of conflicts like this? Because Yugoslavia was not a member of NATO. It was a former member of the Warsaw Pact. It also was not a member of any European uh, in integrative structure except for CSC. But CSC was debating the issue and not coming up with any answers. In other words, nobody wanted to deal with the conflict in Yugoslavia. And at this moment, uh, one of the answers that emerged mainly in the United States that something like this peacekeeping in Europe could be a new mission for NATO. And like I said, this I see as one major development, one major contingency uh, 
that changed how the story developed. Now we're going, um, if there are no immediate questions here, does anybody want to ask anything? Uh, let me see, no chat. Okay, then we're going back to Russia and we will look at how once the Soviet Union falls apart, what happens in the relationship between Russia and NATO. Again, here is one of the myths that we kind of live with. And we think that from the very beginning, the Russians were very hostile toward NATO. In fact, the evidence, the documents, and the memoirs of the uh, le leaders, both in Europe and in Russia, show that in 1992 and most of 1993, when we have is a honeymoon between Yeltsin and NATO. Um, we will see new, we see numerous trips of NATO officials to Russia, including uh, Secretary General Manfred Warner, meetings between NATO officials and Russian officials, both politicians and the military, and very, very active cooperation at the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Exchanges of delegations. Um, now I was able to see memorandum of conversations between the NATO leaders um, and the Russian officials. And you know, if you read them, these are very cooperative, very friendly conversations. And in these, in these conversations, what they're talking about is about NATO new relationship with Russia. Now, the way Yeltsin saw this relationship is that future Europe will be created in, this, in the framework of this cooperation. Yeltsin in 1992, 1993 still saw himself as the leader of the superpower. He was not, the superpower was gone but he believed that he still has the same weight as the Soviet Union did. And so um, in his mind, Russia and NATO will be the main decision makers. They will create new security structures. They will create the new post-Cold War Europe. Uh, but like I said, um, Yugoslavia was falling apart and nobody but NATO was willing to intervene to prevent the bloodshed. So gradually, with this background of Yugoslavian collapse, there was a realization, or at least realization in the United States that Europe needed the US intervention to keep peace. Kind of like after World War I and World War II, if the United States are out of Europe, these bloody conflicts happen and the Europeans can take care of themselves. This is actually uh, some of the subjects that were discussed inside uh, the Clinton administration. So NATO now has some rationale um, for peacekeeping operations or out of area operations uh, in the areas that are not NATO uh, territory, NATO member territory. In 1993, something changes uh, within the Clinton administration, which in the beginning was not discussing such issues as NATO expansion. You see that by the summer of 1993, a lot of people raised this issue. And what about Eastern Europe? East European leaders come to Washington, uh, especially Lech Walesa and Václav Havel, and the Hungarian leadership. At the opening of the Holocaust Museum, they tell Clinton that it would be the best for East Europeans to be integrated in European institutions, such as the European Union and NATO to guarantee their security. And this plea and the conversation about possible uh, in security if Russia reverts back to a version of communist regime, this really affects Clinton. He emotionally responds uh, 
to these leaders, uh, some of them experienced Soviet intervention, like in Poland, in, in Hungary in 1956, almost intervention in Poland in 1981, and of course, Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia. So uh, it really makes sense for Clinton that these countries would be seeking security guarantees. And this is where serious debate about NATO expansion happened uh, in the Clinton administration. In the summer of 1993, as I mentioned, there is a key memorandum that was prepared uh, inside the Clinton administration that lays out a plan of a possible NATO expansion. But the most interesting thing about that memorandum is that the expansion would include Ukraine, Belarusia, and Russia by 2005. So this is an interesting idea, right? NATO, NATO will expand, but NATO will not just select some countries and isolate others. Russia would also be a member. Remember in the 1990s, uh, both the United States and Russia, Clinton and Yeltsin were very actively talking about close partnerships, strategic partnership between Russia and the United States. Now, this is where the honeymoon between Russia and, the, and NATO ends. Once the Russians realize that the United States is now pushing toward NATO expansion, they were very quickly and very strongly against expansion. When Yeltsin visits uh, Poland in 1993, Lech Walesa, uh, the president of Poland, asks him directly if Yeltsin would be against uh, Poland joining NATO. And Yeltsin, who also had a lot to drink at the moment, he said, no, he would not because every country has the right to choose its alliances. Once he says that, the Poles uh, proclaim that the Russian president just promised that Poland could join NATO. So there should be no other obstacles. Yeltsin, of course, is attacked domestically for saying something like this. So in September 93, uh, Yeltsin writes, a letter to Clinton explaining his position. He says, if NATO expanded, or even if, if the decision was made by the United States for NATO to expand, he, Yeltsin says, not only the opposition, but even moderate circles as well in Russia would no doubt perceive this as a sort of new isolation of our country in diametric opposition to its natural admission into Euro-Atlantic space. Yeltsin also argues in this letter that the spirit of the German Unification Treaty signed in 1990 precludes the option of expanding the NATO zone into the East. So basically, the Russians very early on raised this issue of isolation, which would uh, result from NATO expansion to the East. But there is another intervening variable that happens. Yeltsin shoots at his own parliament in September 1993, suspends the constitutional court, and adopts a constitution with super presidential powers. The bloodshed in Moscow, Yeltsin's intolerance of opposition, and then later in December 93, election of uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, which is Zhirinovsky's party, which is really uh, like the opposite of its own name. It is a uh, nationalist, conservative, pr pretty much Russian chauvinist party, the election of 25% of the Duma, the lower house of the Russian parliament, scared both the liberal opposition in Russia and East Europeans. And East Europeans looking 
and Russian, at the Russian government shooting in a, at its own parliament and then suppressing any opposition, even suspending the constitutional court, East Europeans got really concerned. East, for East Europeans, it looked like Russia was reverting to some kind of, if not communist past, but certainly authoritarian past. And their demands uh, to join NATO became much stronger. In response to the Russian concerns, the Clinton administration decided that it could persuade the Russians not to be afraid of NATO. And this is, this is a strange idea. Uh, but Clinton actually did believe that they could do both. Uh, have good relationship, even partnership with Russia, and at the same time expand NATO without Russia. Um, the first wave of expansion, of course, was seen as a very limited wave of expansion. And to pacify Russia, to uh, help Russia swallow this, the United States proposed a new form of cooperation, which was called Partnership for Peace. Uh, Partnership for Peace was this program uh, which was seen as kind of a, an entry or half house on the way, halfway house on the way to NATO. So in this Partnership for Peace, the militaries of different countries will start cooperating very closely, mainly on peacekeeping. There would be a lot of interaction there would be a lot of informing each other about the maneuvers, uh, learning about each other, transparency. And through this partnership for peace, which would be open to everybody, there would be no selection. Everybody could become a member of partnership for peace. The United States believed that through this partnership for peace, they could create space where some countries will join NATO and some countries will just stay in this Partnership for Peace program and cooperate. However, the way they presented this program to Russia, and uh, if you're interested, you should look at uh, some of the literature that I suggested. We published all the documents um, in the two postings, uh, what Gorbachev heard about NATO expansion, and what Yeltsin heard on NATO expansion, it is on the website of the National Security Archive and it's in your readings. So you could read these words yourself and see how does it sound. So the way it sounded to the Russian officials, to Yeltsin, is that there will be no immediate NATO expansion, that the partnership for peace would be instead, instead of expansion. And so the Russians supported partnership for peace very strongly, thinking that if they cooperate through this program in this framework, there will be no expansion. However, the ambassador um, at the time, the US ambassador in Russia understood all the difficulty and all the sensitivity of this issue for the Russians and he argued for a very slow expansion of NATO, if such a decision is made. In one of his wonderful cables that we uh, helped declassify, he said that the NATO issue is neurologic to the Russians. They expect to end up on the wrong side of a new division of Europe if any decision is made quickly. I mean, this is prophetic, <laughs> pretty much. They did end up on the wrong side of the division of Europe. No matter how nuanced I am uh, quoting from the cable, if NATO adopts a policy which envisions expanding into Central and Eastern Europe without holding the door open to Russia, it would be universally interpreted in Moscow as directed against Russia and Russia alone, or as neo-containment. If we look at the Russian reaction 
um, in the mid 1990s to NATO expansion, what we see is something that never happened with the Russian political spectrum. NATO expansion was the only issue, seriously, the only issue which united all the parties and factions in the Russian parliament. There was no single other issue on which there was a consensus in the parliament and, and among the Russian elite. So this is what you can see if you look at the documents, the Duma discussions, if you interview people. At the same time, on the US side, there was an impression, and I myself saw it in my interviews and work with American officials um, of that period. They sincerely believed that, oh, well, there are some conservatives in Russia, you know, some uneducated people, backward people who, yeah, they oppose NATO. But the majority of the political elite and Yeltsin himself, they can live with this as long as we have good relations between Russia and the United States. And this is completely wrong. It means that either American officials were willfully misreading Russian strong opposition, or they still believed that you could either persuade or bribe the Russians, Yeltsin, to accept NATO expansion. And Yeltsin did go along eventually, but you know, what else could he do? If NATO decided to expand, yes, Yeltsin signed the documents of partnership for peace and not a later Russian NATO charter, but it does not mean that he actually agreed. Yeltsin was strongly opposed. And in fact, um, he pretty much uh, you know, pleaded with Clinton not to expand when Clinton came to Moscow in 1995, here's from their conversation. Yeltsin says, I see to Clinton directly, one-on-one, -on -one, I see nothing but humiliation for Russia if you proceed with NATO expansion. Why do you want to do this? We need a new structure for pan-European security, not old ones. But for me to agree to the borders of NATO expanding toward those of Russia, that would cons constitute a betrayal on my part of the Russian people. That's a pretty strong quote. And yet, Clinton had other priorities. He needed, he needed Yeltsin on his side. Yeltsin was a good partner with all his problems and uh, intolerance of opposition and drinking he was a good partner he was a great partner in arms control he eventually signed the nato russia founding act yeltsin also had other priorities yeltsin was interested in further arms control he was interested in partnership with the united states for the reasons of prestige and continuing his kind of russian status as a superpower also he needed economic aid also, he wanted to become a member of G7. And so a grand compromise was struck. Yeltsin would not argue too strongly about NATO expansion and hope that this one round, the first round of NATO expansion, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland would be the last round. And Yeltsin actually did believe that this is what will happen. So in May 1997, the uh, Russia NATO Founding Act uh, was signed and then resulted in extensive exchange and consultation programs. A lot of NATO offices opened in Moscow and Russia was accepted into G7, making it G8. So, um, the first round, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland were invited to begin the accession process in uh, 1997. And on March 12, 1999, they became the first members 
former members of the Warsaw Pact to join NATO. Note the date, March 12, 1999. The argument for NATO expansion was that NATO does not threaten Russian security. All that NATO does is provide security for its members. NATO will consult and cooperate with Russia on all the security issues. So the first round of expansion is finalized on March 12, 1999. And on March 24, um, 1999, NATO starts bombing Belgrade over the conflict in Kosovo, notwithstanding Russia's strong objections. So Serbia uh, at the time is one of very few Russian allies that are still left as allies. And Russia is very concerned about the situation in the former Yugoslavia. Russia was willing to mediate. Russia was willing to provide peacekeeping forces, but without informing Russia, NATO starts bombing Yugoslavia literally less than two weeks after the first round of expansion. That leads to huge fallout inside of Russia. Uh, the parliament demands full break with NATO. The parliament holds several hearings and recalls members from all NATO structures in which Russia participated. So a full breakdown of NATO-Russia relations occurs after the NATO uh, bombings of Yugoslavia. Here we come to um, the early 2000s and the new president of Russia and the new rounds of expansion of NATO. And this moment is another um, moment where we have a lot of contingency and unpredictable futures. So there is a full breakdown of uh, NATO-Russia relationship. The uh, Russia-NATO charter is not working any longer. There are essentially no contacts and a very militant opposition in the parliament. And Putin becomes president as a result of Yeltsin pretty much handing him the uh, seat uh, announcing him as his successor. And Putin completely, completely reverses Russian position on NATO. And the way it happens is so radical. It is hard to imagine a more radical 180 degree turn. So Putin becomes um, president. He is not yet formally elected, but he is uh, interim president on December 31st, 1999, but it's pretty clear to everybody that he will become the new president. He immediately reaches out to the NATO leadership <clears throat> and invites NATO Secretary General uh, Lord Robertson to Moscow already in February 16, 2000. And if you look at the debate in the parliament and parliament at the moment is actually a functioning parliament. In the late 1990s, Russia did have an active parliament and the parliament is pretty much in shock saying, look, you know, what's going on? We just broke off all the relationship with NATO and now we're inviting their leadership to Moscow. But Putin pretty much um, calls people to order and persuades um, forces and insists that this is now a new era of Russian uh, NATO relationship. And in addition, not only that, <clears throat> Putin actively seeks publicly and privately talking about NATO membership for Russia. He seriously raises the question that Russia actually wants to become a member of NATO 
Uh, a new institution is created in May 2002. Uh, the name of the new institution is NATO Russia Council. And <clears throat> Russia starts participating in NATO summits, sends its delegates in NATO Parliamentary Assembly once again. NATO offices reopen everywhere throughout Russia. I actually, in the early 2000s, I worked, we organized conferences jointly with the NATO representatives in Russia, which now I can't even, you know, I can't even think about something like this. You don't know where you will end up if you cooperate with NATO now. So while this rapid improvement of NATO-Russia relations occurs, uh, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia were invited to, to start accession talks to become member of NATO. And they joined NATO in March 2004. The important moment here is that uh, the Baltic republics, former republics and now independent states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were part of the Soviet Union. So this is not just a territorial expansion of NATO. This is really a new substantive level of NATO expansion going into the former Soviet Union, which before sounded like a red line, sounded like it could never happen. And it happened. And Russia expressed its uh, disappointment, but did not make any um, threatening moves or did not really seriously even object because at the time Putin's priority was cooperation with the United States with NATO and eventually becoming a NATO member. So again, here's this idea that we have that Russians were, you know, so strongly anti-NATO. And in fact, there were eras, there were uh, uh, moments in time when they weren't, they were actively cooperating, especially under Putin. Now, the key moment happens in 2008, because in 2008, the red line that Putin very clearly defined was crossed. Um, at the Bucharest summit of NATO, uh, Georgia and Ukraine were not yet invited, but pretty much promised by the United States that they would become members of NATO. And this is something that Russia saw as a direct threat to its vital security interests, uh, especially Ukraine. As we know, in 2008, after that Bucharest summit, uh, Russia crossed, Russian troops crossed the borders into Georgia and uh, stayed there in South Ossetia. And Georgia lost two of its territories, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And uh, after that, you don't really see serious discussion of NATO expansion to Georgia, of course, if Russia is pretty much occupying these two territories, it's hard to talk about NATO membership. And this, at the same time, the discussion of NATO membership for Ukraine also stopped. And we hear a lot right now um, in, in the speeches and I'm sure in telephone conversations, which we don't hear between the Ukrainian leadership and American leadership. The Ukrainians are still interested in joining NATO, but there is no willingness and uh, certainly no uh, desire on the part of NATO to proceed with Ukrainian membership at this moment when Russia annexed the Crimea and when Russia is involved in the conflict in East in Eastern Ukraine, in Donbass. So I come here to the conclusion. Um, people have different opinions, certainly about the expansion and the wisdom of expanding NATO. Uh, 
Uh, George Cannon, probably the best known so Sovietologist and uh, expert on Russia in the United States, said that expanding NATO was the most fate fateful, fateful error in the US foreign policy. Um, Paul Nietzsche, the leading US arms control negotiator and close advisor to um, American Republican presidents, also believed that expanding NATO was not wise. Um, I do think that expanding NATO at the time when it was expanded created a different Europe, that there were other ways of building the post-Cold War space. And with that decision and carrying it out, a lot of opportunities in US-Russian relations and generally in European security were lost. And I would like to um, end with a quote from Mikhail Gorbachev, who said in November 2014, when he came to Germany to celebrate the anniversary of the fall of the wall, when he said is, what is happening now is the collapse of trust. The trust that was created by hard work and mutual effort in the process of ending the Cold War. Trust without which international relations in the global world are inconceivable. This trust was not undermined yesterday. It happened long before the roots of the current situation lie in the events of the 1990s. And I would just like to end with saying that there is a lot of really good research that's happening right now on the issue of NATO expansion. I would especially recommend the new book of Mary Sarotti that is coming out in the fall of this year on NATO expansion. I would recommend uh, new articles by James Goldgeier and Joshua Schifferson on the subject. And of course, you can always contact me at the National Security and look at our postings. And now let's go to the floor is open.